If you got your Bibles this morning, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. We're going to do the second part of what's probably going to be at least a five-part message. Last week we covered the first part, and um, we're discussing when you go over the Jordan. What does the Lord require of thee? Now, as we described last week, going into the Promised Land, crossing the Jordan, literally means crossing that river of death, the separation point from those who are in, G in Egypt and still stuck in the wilderness of sin and those who cross over the Jordan. The Jordan is that point where it was called descent because it was not uncommon to see people swept away in animals by the power of the Jordan River and, and be found in the, in the lower parts of the Dead Sea. But you see, when you're in Christ, just like he says in Ezekiel, you'll either, you'll either go across on dry land with the priests or you'll be taken through the waters. The flood that comes from the throne of Christ where some just put their foot in, some go into the ankles, just like a water. Some test the waters and some just dive in. That's where Stephen Curtis Chapman, I believe, got the idea for his song, I'm diving in, I'm going deep. Over my head, that's where I want to be. Let the rivers flow, take me. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to talk about what does the Lord require of thee? We covered last week about the Anakin, about the cities, the things that you would encounter. And I want to remind you that in Deuteronomy chapter 9, what Moses is doing is preparing them. He's giving them caution. And, and he's, he's doing this. So they will understand that it is not attributed, the conquering of this new world will not be according to their righteousness. But it will be because of the wickedness of the nations, and they have become an instrument of God's hand to judge the wicked. And may I tell you that when you are in Christ Jesus, you have become an instrument to judge the wicked. Father, I pray and ask that you would give us your holy word today, that you would teach us, lead us, guide us, strengthen us, Encourage us, because we are weak and feeble. We need thee. Thou art the ultimate. Thou art God. You need nothing. We are dependent upon your hands. Lord, fire us up. Put your Holy Spirit burning through us, cleansing us. Let your light shine from us. And let it drive back the darkness. Let us be the city on the hill. But in all things, let Christ be glorified, lifted up. And let his name be proclaimed. In Christ Jesus' name I do pray, Father. Amen. You see, my friend, is this. Is when you got saved, you were immersed or baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. You went through the waters of the Jordan. You descended down. But praise be to God, he raised you up from the Jordan. And he set your feet on the dry land. And you followed that ark, the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, with himself being the ark, himself being the manna, himself being the word of God and the rod that budded inside of that ark, himself being the power that stopped the mighty Jordan so that his priests could walk over on dry, solid land. He that held the Jordan, not for an hour, not for two hours. He held the Jordan for the better part of a day. Do you imagine the power of God to stop a mighty river from flowing? He had to stop the waters going into that river. He had to literally stop the waters all the way up. And he didn't do it for a moment. He did it for probably five hours at least. How do I know this? Because he commanded that they go and find each tribe the biggest stone they could find. Friends, when we think of an Ebenezer, like I love Ken Ham, I love Answers in Genesis, and they built an Ebenezer and they built it out of stones that they could pick up that were hollowed out and they put it. And, you, and I would recommend you go to the, the Answers in Genesis. I recommend you go to Kentucky. I want to take my family there. I want to see the Ebenezer and all the testimonies of Christ. But if you get to the Jordan River, the Ebenezer of the Israelites is still there to this day. And folks, we're talking about rocks that are not this big. We're talking about rocks that took dozens of men to pick up from each tribe. Each tribe wanted their rock to be the biggest. Because they wanted their children to know what they had done. And they were high on the power of God. Can you imagine seeing this happen? 
And when he stopped the waters, friends, don't you know it dried up all the way to the Dead Sea? Folks, think of the ultimate power of God and how he did that. And then he held it until they would gather those rocks and they bring them in to the center of the Jordan and they stack them so that it was higher than the Jordan. My friends, we're talking about rocks that are three feet in thick. We're talking about rocks that are bigger than this table. Why? Because the Jordan is, is 25, 30, 40 feet deep. You would have to have massive rocks <laughs> stacked to get on there. And he waited until the Israelites worked together and put the Ebenezer, the stone of remembrance. May I tell you, it is Jesus Christ that is our stone. Someday I'll do a message on the 12 tribes and what all 12 of their names mean in succession and how they tie into the Ebenezer. Ebenezer, of course, being the stones of remembrance. You see, what it recognizes is this. is Jesus Christ that stands in the waters. The waters come from his throne. And those stones of remembrance were for all 12 of the tribes, symbolizing all those that God has called by his name. And do you understand the hardness of the rock represents how your heart was hard. But when you entered into the Jordan, Jesus gave you a heart of flesh. He said, just like he said in, in Jeremiah, I will take your heart that is harder than adamantium, the hardest nether stone, and I will circumcise it and I will make it flesh. And the hardness of your heart was placed upon Jesus Christ in the waters of the Jordan. He took that which would have destroyed you but now he stands in the gap in the Jordan and the waters of his wrath are flowing over himself. He took the wrath and has cleansed you from all that defiles and it is left behind. Friend, you have crossed into the Jordan. He has given it to you. He has promised you this land. Why? Because he made the promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. What was the promise? Abraham, look to the stars. See if you can count them. Look to the sands of the sea. See if you can count them. And I tell you, your children will be as many as the stars of heaven, sands of the sea. I have heard scholars. I have people that are into astrophysics. I won't say his name because he slams me when he gets the opportunity. And I'm done with him. But friends... You'll, they say there haven't been that many Jews. May I tell you, it's because he promised to Abraham, I will bring unto you all the ethnos, all people of the world, and they shall worship at my feet. He says, Abraham, you're going to bring forth a seed by which shall rule the world. And all ethnos, all languages, all tongues will come unto him, and he shall teach them all. He shall lead them all. They will sit at his feet with the ass, with the lion, with the viper. The ass, the lion, and the serpent will lie together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. I can't wait, friends. I'm telling you what. I, I, hope, I hope to see that. I know there's going to be people that have had children that have gone on to be with the Lord. You get there and you're going to see them riding around on lions. I know there are going to be people riding lions because I want to. And I'm going to, because God loves me and I'm a kid to him. And, but the promised land is this. He's promised it to Abraham and to his seed. And why? Because it represents those who are outside of Christ. You are going to meet the Anakim, the Emims, two different groups. The Emim was the name that they learned on the other side of the Jordan. And it, the name actually means terrors. They're, they're different than the Anakim. And I did not know that last week, and so I learned more this week. The Emims were called terrors because there were some of them, they said, up to 30 feet in height. They said that we are like grasshoppers to them. And, and when they talked about them, they talked about them as being cannibalistic, but they didn't always look like what we would picture a giant. Some of them had a single cyclopean or a single eye in the middle of their head. Some of them, like the Anakin, which I just learned this week through a Jewish expositor, 
said they were called the giants or the people of the serpent, the long necks. And they had a long neck and a serpentine head. If you want to know what these giants look like, some of them look like people, but some of them look like those gods of Egypt. And they were descended from those, what we'd call Nephilim. So they had many twisted forms. And the Anakin, because they had such a long neck, it was a vulnerable spot. So they would wrap it with rings. And they would put a jewel on that ring to make it look pretty. And still to this day, and here's why, the word used for the emims is also the word used for idolatry. When you go to Hosea chapter 1, verse 7, you're going to find the word terrors there. It's emims. When you get into Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 4, verse 7, it's where the root from Emen comes from. And I, I found probably 30 places in the Old Testament where it was discussed. And every time it was a word the Israelites had made and learned from the Moabites. It is a term from the Moabite. And it is a term Emen. And what does it mean? It means terror and dread that overcomes you because the Moabites would hide in the caves from the Emims because they hunted specifically for humans to eat. And so when an Emim came, it brought terror and dread upon you. You know what is even worse? Is when the Emim came, it not only brought terror and dread, but it is equated throughout the Psalms with the horrors that come upon you when an army has come upon you. And that's why it is the word used to describe the horrors and wrath. When the Lord says, I will bring upon you a horrible, terrible nation called the Assyrians, and they shall judge you for your wickedness. The Israelites didn't believe them. But the word they used for the root, describing the Assyrians, is like the Emim. Why? Because one giant was the equivalent of an army. That is why David took a sling and not a sword. You had to hit them from a distance. The average arm length of one of them would have been five to six feet. The average length of their weapon that they had would have been six to 12 feet in length. You would have to get within 18 feet and they would be able to strike you. Just coming upon them, imagine a leg that's eight feet long with a foot that is almost three feet long and two feet wide. It is going to kick you and send you flying or crush you and stomp you like a grasshopper. In Deuteronomy 2, verse 10, the Emens dwelt therein in times past. What? The promised land. They were a people great and they were many. Great means they were all joined together. When you fought one, they would sound the alarm and they would all come. And they are tall as the Anakims, which were accounted as giants as the Anakins, but the Moamites call them the Emins, Deuteronomy 2, 10 and 11. He says it again in Deuteronomy 2, 21. There's a people great and many. Why? Because the original spies that went into the land came back and they're all dead now except for Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because they didn't believe God could kill them. They, they said they're going to eat us, that we will be a prey for them. How many Christians today are afraid to speak the word of truth? We were listening to John MacArthur this morning. By the way, I love John MacArthur. He's my go-to preacher. I love Pastor Staley. I have a, a list I love. But John was talking about how the world would turn against you, how they will ban things. how they, And it's happening, folks. There's coming a point where unless you take the mark, and mark always means to join yourself to the philosophies and teaching of unless you take the mark of the beast you will not be able to buy nor sell i was notified this morning that more of my stuff has been taken off of amazon i was telling my wife i said i'm gonna to have to find a new way to sell books because they keep banning my christian books because they're offending people that are not christian i'm okay with that i don't want to offend them i want them to get saved i want them to walk in christ so friends, what is it about the Anakins and the Emons that brought terror? It was because they were so demonically, supernaturally built and created. They were an abomination against God. I'm going to tell you something, friends. Today, we're living in a world that is filled with giants. 
The world is filled with giants, and these giants are abominable before God. Why? Because they don't believe in God. They don't fear God. There is nothing before their eyes except conquering and to conquer. <coughs> there are many Nimrods that have risen up amongst us, and they rule and reign over this world through their commodities, through the control of money. But may I tell you this? You're going to face them today, and you are facing them. Because all around us, there is a hatred for Christianity. Moses is preparing them. He's saying the Lord, verse 21, he destroyed all the Emim on this side. <laughs> That's why you guys don't know about them. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Except the only people alive over the age of 20, and they've been wandering 40 years, is Moses. No, he gets killed after this. Will be Joshua and Caleb. So they've been wandering 40 years. Because this is a speech right before they go over and Moses is going to be taken to be with the Lord. So these 20 year olds never saw a giant. The Lord's telling them, they're there. I'm going to take you into that land. They're going to hate you. They're going to hunt you down for food. And you know, was just this last week, me and my wife were talking. I was telling her, as a Christian today, it's hard because the court systems are against you. People cheat you. We hire contractors. They come in and they rob us. They destroy things. I'm still repairing things they've done because they're liars and cheats. They do things not fully. They do them halfway. It's an evil and a violent world. And just like in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the second coming of the Son of Man. For they were marrying themselves to unholy spirits and giving their children over to unholy spirits. And isn't that the truth today? Why is all TV filled with filth? It is so hard to find anything suitable or even semi-clean to watch. Why is the music of the world so filthy? Because it is the God of this world who has empowered them and made them into abominations against the Lord God to where now they no longer consider righteousness, but they consider themselves righteous. Friends, God destroyed the giants on the other side of the river so he could take you to heaven. You say, but Pastor Tom, that's old news. That's biblical. You can't even really prove it except for all the giant skeletons around the world. And all the evidence that shows where they lived and the giants that they killed in Condor and brought back to the United States just eight years ago. You can't prove any of that. But let me ask you something. Did any of you have a giant like a sexual addiction? Money addiction? Idolatry? Were you a thief? Were you a liar? Did you cheat people? And then one day God came into your heart and he gave you a love for him and a love for people? Did he strike down those things in your life that you couldn't overcome? Depression? Anxiety? I'll tell you what, before I got saved, Honest truth, I went through $150,000 in six months. My company, it's like Jim Tietrich who trained me. He says, Tom, I don't get out of bed unless I know I'm making $500 a day. Jim Tietrich was a math teacher at Sandwich High School. His wife was an English teacher. They went to build themselves a house. He says, it's easy. It's sold when they were only halfway through. So they finished it. They went to build two more houses. They sold before he was done. So he quit teaching, became a construction company, teacher construction, and became a multimillionaire. And I didn't know it because he lived in a little bitty two-bedroom house, smaller than this house. And somebody paid for my kids to go to Christian school. I didn't know who it was. It wasn't until after they were half grown. And that's when he sat me down right before I went to Bible college. He says, Tom, it's like this. I'm a very wealthy man. I wasn't. He said, but I gave it to God. He says, I pay for two planes. I pay for the pilots and the planes to be fully loaded with medical food, clothes, everything they need. And I send it to Mexico twice a year. Why? Because he had the love of God in him. Friends, God destroyed the giants in your life and he's going to take you into the promised land. But guess what? It's not because of your righteousness. It's because of Jesus Christ, the Ebenezer, our rock, who stands in the, in the tide on our behalf. So friends, he will destroy the giants in your life. 
And guess what? You will overcome the giants in this promised land. Why? Because the face of God, as I said last week, will go before you. And he says that, verse 3, Understand therefore this day, the Lord thy God is he which goeth before thee. Now what it means, it means his face is going before you. And it is a consuming fire. It, it means it will literally destroy everything that does not flee. What does this mean? Friends, it means while you're in this promised land, this land given to Abraham and his descendants, of which you're a part if you're in the church, it means if the devils and the demons don't flee before thee, because light drives the darkness out, God will destroy them and drive them from you. The light always drives out the darkness. And he says, I have made you this day a proverb. I have made you this day a light. I have made you this day a city on a hill that cannot be ignored. So he's going to drive them out quickly. The word no, <laughs> when he says, understand this day, the Lord thy God is he which goeth before thee. He, a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. This word Know this of a certainty, what he uses in this phrase, it is a word of dead sobriety. And what it means is this. Dead sobriety means you're looking at somebody who is one, not trusting in you, doesn't believe you, or has just given themselves over to their own fears and thoughts. So it's when somebody stops and looks you in the eye and waits till you quit speaking, and he says with dead sobriety, it is God that is going to go before you and defeat them. You just have to trust in God. Call upon him because he will answer you. But you must believe that he will. God, my friend, has gone before us into this world. When you go into the workplace, know of a certainty God has gone before you and simply trust in him. Know of a certainty when your children or your friends or your family turn against you. If you run into the arms of Jesus Christ, he will lift you up and he will do the work he's promised. You're going to face the giants. God will destroy them. You are going to go into a land of hostility, but God will go before you. So be ye strong and of good courage, just like Joshua told them. And realize this, the reason why God is doing this in your life, why he's going to do it in the life of the Israelites, is because of his own mercy and providential care of his children. Look at verses 3 through 5 again. Understand therefore this day, the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. He shall bring them down before thy face. You'll get to see it. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly. As the Lord has said unto thee, Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God has cast them out before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord has brought me into this, possess this land. But it's for the wickedness of these nations the Lord drives them out before thee. It's not for thy uprightness, verse 5, or the uprightness of thine heart, does thou go to possess the land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee, and that they may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. So he says it again, understand, and this is the word no, it means graveyard dead. You have to be serious, my friend. You have to know. It is not by your righteousness that anything will happen in your life. Understand, therefore, that's the word no, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked people. Therefore, this day the Lord, the God, which is he which goeth before thee as a consuming fire, will destroy them. Friends, I'm going to touch upon this. Many people believe it's by their own works of righteousness that things happen. We are to take time to be holy. We find that in three places. I'm going to address that in message six. 
because once is for the Father in Leviticus, and then for the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. It's said three times, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Leviticus. But friends, we've got to understand this. Your victories in life aren't going to be because of your righteousness. You have no righteousness. All your righteousness is as lepers, filthy, unusable, but burned in the fire, rags. What does it mean? What is that fire? Well, I'll tell you, at the bema or the seat of rewards, the holy fire will come upon you. And it's going to burn you from everything that is of the flesh, everything that is of the world. And all that will remain is that which God has done for you. It's not you. You say, well, what do you mean? How could it be that way? Because God works through you for you. My friend, it is not by righteousness that anyone shall ever see the face of the Lord because you are not righteous. So what is he doing? He's telling them that he is going to judge the wickedness of the land. Do you understand it? And this is something you need to understand. Paul tells the Corinthian church, he says, you are a sweet smell of sacrifice. To those that receive the Lord, you are a sweet smelling of their preservation or their salvation. Both. But you are also bringing forth a sweet smell of the death of the wicked. And that is a sweet smell. Why? Because it is the pleasure of God to destroy the wicked and preserve those that he's chosen for his own self. You see, you didn't choose God. If you're seeking after God, it's because he chose you. And that is the mercies the indelible mercies of a holy God. He placed his spirit within you so now he can work through you as a vessel. And just like that empty torch that's been dipped and filled with oil and fire placed to it, everywhere it goes now it burns. And the indelible, indefable Lord God himself, his flame never dieth. His oil never runs out. He has preserved you and baptized you. You have gone down with Christ when you went into and through the Jordan. And now he wants to give you the land. And he has. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the world. I will neither forsake you nor leave you. He says, but go ye forth, making disciples of all ye meet, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And know this, lo, I am with you to the end. Do you know what that literally means in the Greek? He not only has your back, but he's going to put you over his shoulder and carry you to get you to the end. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. It is an incredible, wonderful thing to know. Friends, God wants to save those that he has called by his name, and he's going to. He says, in, my mem in your book, all my members were written, David says. You knew me before I was born. You created me and designed me. In sin, in iniquity was I conceived, but thou art my God. Thou art holier. For thine eyes cannot look upon sin not judge it. Aren't you glad that it's not by anything in you. It's unmerited because there's no righteousness in you. But it's because of the righteousness of God. Because he says, for my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. Say that not. But rather, because of the wicked, God's going to bring you in so that you can be the light that he uses to drive out the darkness. So understand, therefore, verse 6, The Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for the righteous, because thou art a stiff-necked people. Do you know what it is to be stiff-necked? Stiff-necked was this. It's when you had a donkey or an ox or a horse that resisted and fought against you as the rider, every turn they won't walk when you tell them to walk my dad 
told me when he was a young boy, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, he was plowing fields for my uncle with a mule. And he was so small, the thing bit a chunk out of him once and um, would try to kick him. And so his uncle, because his father had passed away already, gave him a club and he would hit that mule right between the eyes first thing in the morning, as hard as he could. And that would make the mule not want to bite him or kick him. But then he said the mule would not walk. So they did hang a piece of fruit or food on a stick in front of it to make it continually walk. He says you got to give it a bite first. And you see that? That's the way people are. Today they say, oh, man, I met a guy yesterday. I do believe him. He loves the Lord. And I struck up a conversation. I, I totally believe that man loves the Lord and is living for the Lord. But how many people believe they're living for the Lord? But if God says, Wait a minute, don't do that, let me turn you this way. Instead, they don't turn their head. They say, no, I'm going to keep looking at what I'm looking at. I know you'll forgive me. I'm that way. Shouldn't be. <laughs> but I am. And so the Lord has to put the club upside my head to make me get, get my attention. Say, hey, Tom, put your eyes back over here. Stop doing what you're doing. And you see, that's the way they were. They resisted and fought against God because they were a self-willed, rebellious people. Friend, aren't you glad that Jesus has changed your heart? And even though you still fight against the Holy Spirit, he lovingly, he doesn't clobber you in the head like you should, but he uses his grace to give you more obedience and he still delivers you. Verse 7, Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. Do you know what's interesting? The wilderness, we think of it as a, as a big jungle or a forest. But actually the word wilderness is the word for a pastor. It's a place where you took the sheep to feed them. And the reason why it was called a wilderness is because it was filled with hostile animals, lions, bears, leopards, marauders, who would look for people and then they would come in and, and slay them and take the women and the children and their sheep. You see, God was leading him through the green pastures, the wilderness. He was feeding them with manna, with quails. But he says, From this day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Verse 7. Friends, doesn't that describe us? <laughs> it is the truth. I didn't go to God until I hit rock bottom. Most people won't. But he delivered me from that, and he began leading me through the wilderness of sin. And he brought me into Horeb, just like he did the Israelites. Look at verse 8. Also in Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath. He's telling them this because he's saying it wasn't because you did anything for me. You didn't do anything good for me. You've never done anything but rebel against me. But yet I take my time. And this word that's used for wilderness and pastor... It means he goes before you, takes out all the poisons, kills or drives out the enemy so he can use it for his sheep. And then he sits with them until they've eaten. He gets up the next day and walks a little bit. It is a slow, gradual process where God leads you through this wilderness filled with sin. So it is a pastor's place. It is a green place. And isn't the goodness and mercies of God all around us? Isn't it green pastures? There's not a single person that cannot pick up a Bible in the United States and read it. There is not a place you can go where there's not the internet or music or, or something that is geared towards leading you to God. His testimony is everywhere. And you can eat as much of the Word of God, you can spend as much time in prayer as you want, but how many of us really get a callus on our knees? Did you know George Washington... His knees were, were thick and scaled. They said the man would spend two, sometimes four or five. They said it was not uncommon to find that he had been up all night on his knees in prayer. But he would go and lead his men. And 
I love John Gano. I've got his books. You can get it from Particular Baptist Press, Particular Baptist Publishing. He was the first chaplain of the United States, and he was George Washington's. And he's the man who led George Washington's salvation, baptized him at William Jewell College. They have an original painting that was done showing George Gano that George Washington said, I want people to remember this man because he changed my life, and he helped me to win this country for God, not himself, God. And that's when he wanted it to become a Christian country and they began leading the others to salvation. God protected George Washington. God led George Washington in prayers. I remember after, it says in Gano's book, after the war ceased against some Indians who were joined with the British, an Indian chief walked up and said, I killed you eight times. You are the man that God will, your God will not let die. He says, your God will not let you die. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I personally shot you eight different times. Well, they said when George Washington would get done for the night and they would help him get into his, his place where he was going to be, he would take his coat off and as he took it off, metal balls would fall. And there would be holes through the coat, but he wouldn't even have known he was shot. They didn't go through his shirt. That's the power of God, my friend. He took them to Horeb next. Horeb is the same, it's, it's the same place, it's Mount Sinai, where the place where God gave the law to Moses and the Israelite. But do you know what that means? The word Horeb means desert and dry. There is nothing living there. And it's symbolic of the law. God gave them the law at Mount Sinai, and he calls it Horeb. God does, because he's saying, by the keeping of the law, it is dry. You will never have life. You will never have nothing but death, because you cannot keep the law. What you do when you keep the law is you make everybody else miserable, because you're saying, I don't smoke. Why are you smoking? I had a person lay into me about that once, and I said, where was the chimney in the tabernacle? I used to smoke. I only quit because it was causing other people to stumble in my church. When the ladies group, by the way, which I think at least two out of the six smoked, because I'd stand out in front of the church and smoke with them. But they didn't want their pastor smoking, so I asked God to take it from me. He did. But do you understand, when somebody tries to keep the law, they get a grudge against everyone else because they know inside they can't keep the law. But they want to appear like they keep the law. But they can't. I told somebody yesterday, I think it was Chloe, and I could tell she was shocked. When a man got in debt, biblically speaking, he was to sell his wife or his children. Do you know she became the other man's wife for the seven years till he got her back? And if she had children, because she was literally his servant and he could do whatever he wanted with her, she had to leave the kids with that man before she went home back to her husband. That's why he says in Isaiah, but also Jeremiah, Where's your papers of divorcement? You don't have them. Where's the paper saying I sent you away? Oh, you don't have them. Where's the paper saying I sold you to someone else? Oh, you don't have them. Why? Because you're a rebellious group and I won't give you up. I won't send you away no matter how much adultery you commit. And that's why I had Hosea get his wife from the whoredoms and then four times go and get her back. Every time she left him, even when she sold herself to a pimp, I made him go buy her, and they charged quadruple what they would pay or more, buy her back, and then when she left him for another man who couldn't afford to feed her, he says, Isaiah, or, or Hosea, take him groceries. Can you imagine for two years going to visit your wife in the arms of another man while you've got two kids at home with you and giving them groceries? Tell me that ain't mercy. Why would he make poor Hosea go through that? Because, my friend, while you're out whoring around with your idols in this world, God is putting the groceries on your table. He's making sure your wheels still turn on your car. If that ain't love and grace, I don't know what is. Friends, you cannot keep the law. It is dry, it is desert, and it will take from you what you have. So what is it? He goes on and he says, this is what it's all about. You need to understand you're going to conquer this new world, but it's not because of what you've done. It's not because of what you're going to do. It's because of what God is doing through you. Just surrender yourself. 
He says, verse 9, When I was gone into the mount to receive the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you. What were the two tables of stone? It was the Jews and the Gentiles. It represented the two nations, the barley loaf and the wheat, who when they would go into the, the priest would make those. He would take those two and he'd stand before the people. He'd pick them from the table, lift them straight up to heaven, bring them down like this to his breast and spread his arms and lean up and then bring them and touch them together and then set them down symbolizing the cross. It's in Leviticus. And then he would break the loaves in half and set them one towards each corner of the table. Why? Because the four horns of the altar was where you would have the mercy of God and the blood of Jesus Christ would be placed, the sacrifice. And that meant the heart would be broken of the Gentiles, the barley, and of the Jews. Because it is a broken and a contrite heart, God does not disguise. Was your heart ever broken by your sin? <laughs> Was there ever a time where you really realized, I do deserve to go to hell? Because you know what? Those tables of stone were hard as a rock, but the law was written on them. And guess what? When Moses saw his rebellious people with Joshua, Joshua, Moses, there's a war in the camp. Oh, man, we got to get down there. No, I wish it was war, Joshua. I would rather have everybody down there murdered than what the Lord's told me. They've gone into worshiping Baal again. So he came, looked over them, cursed them, and threw the tables down and broke them. Symbolizing their hard hearts that the law was written on had now become broken. And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days, the Lord said, Arise, get down quickly. The people have brought forth the believer. They corrupted themselves. They are quickly. And don't we turn aside quickly, folks? They turned aside out of the way, which I commanded them. You can't keep the law. And they made them a molten image. It's interesting, the word molten. Molten actually means, and it, it, it can mean other things, like stews and things. For instance, when the lentil soup was seen by Esau, oh, I'm going to die, brother. Just give me a bowl of soup. Give me some of that molten soup there. I'm going to die. you really going to die? No. But what will you give me in return? Well, you know, I don't want to be the priest. Why don't you? You've been wanting it. You've been wanting to be the priest of this family, so I'm going to let you be the priest. Just give me a bowl of that soup and any crackers if you got them. He sits down and sells his birthright, the one who would represent the family before God, to slay the animals and bring the sacrifices. Why? Because he didn't care about God, his sacrifice, or anything. But Jacob, who was the sneaky, contriver, manipulator, wicked little brother, because he was, if you were going to shoot dice, Jacob would rob you. If you had something he wanted, he'd talk you out of it. Jacob, his name means supplanter, means he takes what you got. And he met his match with Uncle Laban. He tried to stick it to him, but he found out. He learned that that's where he got the ability to be a manipulator, was it came through the lineage of his Uncle Laban, through his mother. And his mother said, listen, son, you're about to lose your inheritance now. You got the birthright, but, you know, stinky Esau's your daddy's boy. He's always out hunting and being a man, protecting us. But you're over here with Mama, and we love you so much. So let me put these goat skins on you so you stink like your brother. And you take in this delicious goat. I've made it just like venison. And he's so old he can't see or taste. Get him to bless you with that. Because his word is his bond. Boy, you smell like the earth which the Lord has blessed. But you sound like Jacob, who's always trying to steal and trick. Is it really you, my son? <laughs> I'm not that liar, Jacob. I'm, of course, your son Esau. And guess what? I, I didn't have to hunt very far. The Lord brought the deer to me. That's why it's already cooked. Ain't that great, Daddy? Friends, God blessed Jacob, and Jacob was the bad guy. Why? Because it was to show you that it's all of God. He says there are stiff-necked people. He says in verse 14, Let me alone that I may destroy them. 
and blot their names out from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than thee. You see, this is where we get a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our intercessor. He's our advocate. And I'm going to finish with this, folks. I know it's been a long one. Moses was a type of Christ, our intercessor. Because to blot out means I'm going to obliterate and exterminate completely. He was going to open the earth up just like he did for Dathan and swallow every one of them. But also, and I'm glad about this, it means to blot out their memory. Friends, my heart is broken this week. I've been bitter, nasty all week towards people. Trying not to be, but it's because... When you have someone you love terribly and they, they don't want anything to do with Christ and they hate you because you're in Christ, it breaks your heart. And just speaking about it, just the pain is unreal. But when you get to heaven, those that have been washed away in the deluge of God's wrath through the descent of the Jordan and end up in the Dead Sea, which is Sheol or hell, because the Dead Sea represented to every Jew hell. Nothing lived there. You will not remember him. He's going to wipe the tears out of your eyes. He's going to take the memories away. And even though the smoke of their torment will rise up forever, you won't remember it. Friends, Job tells us in verse 25, verse 4, How can a man be justified with God? How can he be clean? That is born of a woman. It means it is impossible. You have nothing good in you. Job 32, 2. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barkal, the son of the Buzai, the kindred of the ram. It means those that worship Baal, but he didn't. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. You see, even this guy, see, he came out of a bunch of Baal worshippers. But Job would say, show me my sin. If God were only here, I would contest with him. Psalm 143 verse 2 says, Enter not into judgment with thy servant. In thy sight shall no man living be justified. So Job got to see God. So did the other four friends. And he says, Whoa, is me. I am undone. In other words, I didn't want this. I didn't know it would be like this. You see, friends, when God, you meet the real God. Oh, man. When you meet the real God, nobody's going to have to tell you this is God. Because the emim is also a word that is used for the terrors and dread that God will bring upon you when he judges you. It is the worst. And that's why emim represented all 12 of the giant races. Why? Because Satan is the god of this world, and the giant races were created by his demonic infestation. And I read with my daughter this week, and I'd never known it before, that when Lucifer, who was turned into Satan, gets cast into hell, he's going to be a man chained, and everything will be cast in. The angels that fell will be turned into men. The people that did not accept Christ will be cast in there on top of him. And we will see the final judgment and say, is this the man that made the nations to tremble? Is this the man that destroyed so much? And it says he will feel the terrors and anguish of everyone in hell. Satan, Lucifer, will be the one called the king of terrors. He will experience everything. God is going to let him rule over hell by suffering and feeling the pain and anguish of everything there. But we, we go to the King of Heaven and we experience all the joys and delights through Him. You see, Moses said in verse 15, So I turned and I came down from the mount. The mount burned with fire. The tables of the covenant were in my two hands. You see, my friend, it's God that made the covenant. He carved it out of the rock himself, which is Jesus Christ. He carved out of Jesus Christ those two tables of stone representing the Gentiles and the Jews. And the law was written on them, which is like a desert, can't ever do anything. And so the law was broken, and so were the hearts of men. 
And though they were worshiping Baal by putting everything they thought valuable into their idols, God saved them. Now let me ask you this, folks. Do you really believe that God is God? And if so, do you actually live a life that tries to serve him? You serve him best by surrendering to him. And if you surrender to the power of God, don't you know that it is Christ, our intercessor, that will do everything that is needed for you and in your life? The only thing he wants us to do, what is required of us? Simply to surrender to him. To recognize the fact that we are sinful, willfully rebellious, stiff-necked people. But God is merciful. And no matter how many times you leave him for the adultery that you commit in this world or the idolatry that you do in this world, he will always wait for you. He will send and provide for you. And when Hosea was there, he would speak love to his wife. He would have the children embrace her. And he would tell her, please come home to me. After the fourth time, her heart broke. And she asked him to forgive her. And she went home permanently with him. They had four children. Let me ask you something. Will you surrender to God today? Will you recognize that there's nothing good in you? You do deserve hell. I deserved hell. But if you've hit that lowest point in your life, quit trying to live by the law. It's like my wife said yesterday. You don't study what's wrong. You study what's right. That's how you know when forgeries happen. Maybe you've been living a forged Christian life that's just been studying everything that's wrong. Can I tell you that's going to do nothing but make you depressed? Everybody knows when things are wrong. Start studying what's right. Like what? You see, God promised them the promised land. Do you know he's promised you he will never leave you? He will never forsake you? Do you promise that he will always lift up that which has fallen? Do you know he's promised you if you raise your kids in the way they should go, he will not reject them when they're older. He will bring them around. Do you know he's promised to always provide for you? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you know that's going to come very real in the United States quickly? It's already very real in most parts of the world. You pray daily for your bread. Do you realize he promises to give you joy, to give you peace? And if you come to the shepherd, he will embrace you and give you joy that will last forever. Friends, before I got saved, like I said, I went through 150 grand in six months. I bought whatever I wanted. I paid cash for it. I bought my nieces and nephews cars and little things and sister cars and father car. And But I was miserable. I I was happy when I was drunk or high, but I was miserable until the day a guy followed me around and I hated him. I wanted, I wanted to hurt him, but he was paying the bill, so I let him follow me around with the Bible on a job site, and then the power of God came even stronger and haunted my dreams three nights in a row until I got on my knees and asked God to forgive me. And friends, I'm going to tell you, it was the greatest moment. It's been 36 years ago, and I'm telling you, I felt the weight lift off my back. He gave me a joy. He gave me a peace that I couldn't understand. I still don't to this day, but I still have the peace and the joy. Let's go into the land. Don't worry about the giants. God will slay them. Don't worry, because he goes before you. And now... Simply embrace the righteousness of God. That is what will destroy the wicked, and that is what will carry us home. Father, I pray and ask that you bless the reading of your word. I pray that you bless this message, and we praise you for giving us the promised land, but even more so when the day you come to deliver us home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.